This video is supported by The Great Courses Plus. A few weeks ago, in the aftermath of the eclipse, there was a rumor that started spreading around the internet claiming that NASA had predicted that because of a planetary alignment, the world would be cast into darkness for 15 days in November. Now, despite the fact that that is completely impossible, I guess because a hundred mile swath of the United States went into darkness for two minutes, some people thought that sounded plausible. Within days it got shared hundreds of thousands of times, the IQ of the planet dropped a few percentage points, and I lost all my faith in humanity. The irony is that in the early 1970s, NASA did predict a rare alignment of the planets, and they used that opportunity to launch an unprecedented space mission, sending not just one, but two probes on a spectacular journey through our solar system, and eventually to the infinite beyond. These were the Voyager missions, and far from casting the planet into darkness, they shed light on a solar system that was more amazing than we ever could have imagined. This month marks the 40th anniversary of their launch, and they're still out there, further than any other man-made object, still teaching us about the universe, and teaching the universe about us. The Voyager probes were launched in 1977, but the idea for the missions was conceived 13 years earlier in 1964. Gary Flandreau, an aerospace engineer working at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, was tasked with finding ways of exploring the outer gas giants. Now, the most popular method of moving throughout the solar system was called the gravity assist technique, which basically means you approach the planet and skim off the surface and use the planet's gravity to slingshot you into another direction. While proposing different trajectories over the next 20 years, he noticed that there was going to be a rare planetary alignment that was going to come up in the late 1970s. All four outer gas giants were going to line up in a way that one single probe could slingshot past all four of them. This was a one in every 175 year phenomena. So he created what he called the Planetary Grand Tour, a plan to visit all four of the outer gas giants in one shot. By the way, we have to stop and acknowledge just how insanely freaking hard the math is on this. This was 1964. He didn't have a computer on his desk. He had just a bunch of equations and slide rules and a bunch of coffee probably. Do you know how hard it is to calculate just where the planets are gonna be in this way? And then you have to factor in all the variables in the spaceship, the speed of the spaceship, the, the angle in 3D space, the strength of the gravitational field in each planet, the distance you have to be above the planet in order to get the right velocity to slingshot you in the right direction, the correct angle to come out of the assist so that you're pointing toward where the next planet's going to be when you get there. All to hit Neptune. 2.7 billion miles away. It would be like firing a bullet in Washington state and hitting a grain of rice in Boston. Except you're flying past four massive electromagnets along the way. Voyager was packed with nine instruments designed to collect images in various wavelengths, collect temperature data, and measure data about particles and plasma in deep space. All powered by radioisotope thermoelectric generators using plutonium-238 as an energy source. Both probes lifted off in 1977, with Voyager 2 actually launching before Voyager 1 on August 20th and September 5th, respectively. But they were named in the order in which they would reach the planets, and Voyager 1 would be traveling faster. Voyager 1 reached Jupiter on March 5th, 1979, and Voyager 2 followed a few months later on July 9th. Together they discovered that Jupiter has a ring system and found volcanoes on Io, the first active volcanoes found outside of Earth in our solar system. They took detailed photos of the Great Red Spot and the clouds in the Jovian atmosphere, they studied the cracks on the surface of Enceladus and got the first photos of Ganymede. They also took detailed measurements of Jupiter's magnetic field and the radiation that it carries. They then traveled on to Saturn, which Voyager 1 reached in November of 1980 and Voyager 2 followed in August of 1981. And this is where they parted ways. Mission scientists were extremely interested in studying Titan after Pioneer 11 had traveled by there and photographed images of a cloudy atmosphere filled with organic compounds. But in order to get a close look at Saturn, it required a polar trajectory, meaning the spacecraft would come out the other side of Saturn and be off of the elliptical plane. So if they were going to study Titan, it was going to be the last planet that that Voyager would see. So Voyager 1 took one for the team and passed within 6,400 miles of Titan where it studied the clouds in its atmosphere. It was too cloudy to see the surface, but Voyager's measurements indicated that there would be hydrocarbon lakes on the surface, far too cold for any life that we know of anyway. And then after a close flyby of Saturn, the gravity assist propelled Voyager 1 up and out of the elliptical plane faster than any other man-made object in history. Voyager 2 had some fireworks of its own when it snapped the now famous pale blue dot photo on request from Carl Sagan. This now iconic photo, taken as Voyager sped away from Saturn, shows Earth as a tiny point of light in the sky, or as Sagan said, a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The point was to bring home the enormity of space and how small and fragile we really are. Voyager 2 continued on to Uranus in January of 1986 and to Neptune in January of 1989. To this day, it's the only spacecraft that's visited either of these planets. 
It found rings around Uranus, photographed the moon Miranda, and found one of the strangest surfaces in the solar system. Found that winds on Neptune blow at over a thousand miles an hour, and that the moon Triton actually spins backwards from every other moon in the solar system. At Neptune, Voyager 2 took a 30 degree turn south toward the edge of the solar system, and continues to provide information about the sun's magnetic field and solar wind. Up in the north, Voyager 1's incredible speed shot it past Pioneer 10 and is now the furthest object ever made by man. In 2012, NASA announced that Voyager had officially entered the heliopause, the space where the sun's rays meet the cosmic rays of the interstellar space, making it the first spacecraft to leave the solar system. There are only five spacecraft so far that will eventually leave the solar system, Voyager 1 and 2, Pioneer 10 and 11, and the New Horizons spacecraft. And Voyager 1's traveling faster than all of them. So unless we invent an interstellar warp drive, Voyager will always be the furthest object we have ever sent out into space. Ever. While most of the instruments have been turned off at this point, it continues to radio information from the particle sensors to provide data on interstellar space. Its signals take 17 hours to reach Earth with energy several billion times less than that of a light bulb. In about 300 years, Voyager 1 will enter the Oort cloud and it'll take about 30,000 years to pass through that. And in 40,000 years, it'll come within 1.6 light years of the star AC plus 79 3888, a star in the constellation of Camelopardalus. But it'll be long dead by then. In fact, its nuclear power is expected to go out in the next three to five years. As the amount of power from the generator fades, NASA will turn off the rest of the instruments one by one, sending only a faint signal to let us know it's still there until it gets so weak that we can't separate it from the background radiation. And then, nothing. Forever. We will never see Voyager again. But another civilization, an alien civilization, could. So when NASA was in preparation for the Pioneer 10 and 11 missions, they realized that this probe would eventually leave the solar system, and they started thinking up ways of maybe putting a message on there, just in case. They reached out to Carl Sagan, who of course loved the idea, and he teamed up with Frank Drake, and over three weeks they came up with this, the Pioneer plaque. It shows a human couple, naked because science, standing in front of the Pioneer probe for scale. Across the bottom is a diagram of the solar system that shows where Pioneer came from and what trajectory it followed out of the solar system. The position of the sun in relation to 14 pulsars. And this. Thing. This was the key that made the whole thing understandable. It represents two hydrogen atoms. Now whenever you're talking about alien communication, hydrogen comes up a lot because it's the most abundant element in the universe and it's something that any advanced alien civilization would know and understand really well. It's also the simplest element with only one proton, one electron. But these two hydrogen atoms have different electron spins. The scientists of an advanced species would know that an electron and hydrogen can flip from an upspin to a downspin. And whatever they call it in their language, we call it a hyperfine transition. In a hyperfine transition, the atom releases a tiny packet of energy in the form of a photon at exactly 1420.405 megahertz, somewhere in the microwave range. This wavelength is exactly 21.106 centimeters, and this little dash in between them represents that length. They then use this code to represent the distance between the sun and those pulsars, as well as the size of the people. They could also use this to convey time as light travels 21 centimeters in 0.7 nanoseconds. Now this was definitely cool, but only showed the aliens where to find us. For Voyager, Carl Sagan had something much bigger in mind. It was called the Golden Record, an actual LP made of gold-plated copper with an ultra-pure sample of uranium-238 electroplated on the surface. They could use the half-life of uranium to tell how old the record is. And on the back of the LP, they used the same hydrogen key to provide instructions on how to play it using the stylus they also included. Instructions that, if decoded, would show that they didn't just record sounds, they embedded images into the disc, and provided a sample of the first image so they know they did it right. Sagan compared the golden record to an interstellar message in a bottle. A message going out to whoever might find it, letting them know that we were here and that we mattered. So what's the likelihood that another civilization might actually find this? It's incredibly unlikely. Space is big, and unless somebody was specifically looking for it, the chances of them finding it are incredibly small. The probe wouldn't give off a heat signature of any kind once the plutonium-238 goes down, so aliens wouldn't be able to pick up any kind of heat coming off of it. If they were anywhere near our solar system, they would probably think it was just another object, piece of debris floating around in the Oort cloud, and besides, they'd learn a lot more about us by just listening to our radio transmissions. And when it does finally get near a star, it's going to be 1.6 light years away from it. That would be impossible for us to see, so it's assumed that it would be really hard for an alien species to see it too. But forever's a long time, and anything's possible. Though it's pretty much guaranteed that if any civilization were able to find it in the far future, we, our planet, our solar system, maybe even our whole galaxy, would be long gone by then. 
So let's just say in the end, after all of our achievements, our monumental ideas, our idyllic monuments, wars, our struggles, our hopes and dreams, millennia of civilizations are long lost to history. In a billion to one stroke of luck, a far future intelligent species, much like us, comes across this weird object floating around in their cosmic backyard. News travels all around the world about this amazing proof of alien life, and the smartest people come together to examine this shiny metal disc with the weird grooves on one side and primitive code on the other. After months of study, a cryptographer figures out how to crack the code, and they play the disc. Scientists and governments debate endlessly before finally deciding that, yes, it was safe to show the public. Around the planet, they gather around their screens and watch as cosmic ghosts from a long-lost civilization reappear again. Oitnis poteste chairete, eirenikos pros filos elelithamen filoi. Paz e felicidade a todos. Gotwai homa, tuk gotwai, ping on, gin hong, fai lo. Adanish lu shulmu. Zdrastuite, privetstuio vas. Sawaddi ka sahai nai thorni pon. Pok rao nai thorni ni, kho song mitajit ma thung than tuk kon. Tahiyatuna lil astika fin nujum, ya leita yajmauna zaman. Salutar la tua te lume. Bonjour tout le monde. Mae la kenya. Shalom. Hola y saludos a todos. Selamat malam hadirin sekalian. Selamat berpisah dan sampai bertemu lagi di lain waktu. Kai pacemat na. Hitapas, maitapas, lima payas, turun asimit. Audi diam. Ashuli. Namaskar. Bishe shantihok. Salve te qui cumque estis. Bonam erga vos voluntatim abemus. Et pacem per astra per. They find a proud species, a loving species, equal parts intelligent and irrational, inscrutable and hardy, survivors, a curious species, a daring species, a silly species, beautiful and strong, a confident species, industrious, a species of explorers, artists, adventurers. They will find us. Thanks, Voyager. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, chances are you like learning things. And if you like learning things, you should really check out The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is an online learning platform with over 8,000 lectures from some of the top professors at Ivy League schools, the National Geographic Foundation, the Smithsonian Institution. You learn at your own pace. There are no tests. You just get more smarter. It's honestly mind-blowing when you go to the site and you see how many courses they have and what subjects they cover. Everything from the origin of languages to cooking to learning how to play chess. It's probably the closest thing we have right now to that scene in The Matrix where he downloads Kung Fu. Right now I'm watching the series Redefining Reality with Dr. Stephen Gimbel and I actually just watched one on quantum field theory where he breaks down the history of particle physics and then gets into how all those particles that we now know are actually just excitations and fields, which means that reality is just a bunch of fields that we can't see. No biggie. And because you guys are awesome, The Great Courses Plus are offering a free month to Answers with Joe viewers. Just go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash answerswithjoe. Link is in the description. Thanks to The Great Courses Plus for sponsoring this video. And while I'm at it, I want to say thanks to the 150 Patreon supporters that are supporting this channel on Patreon and helping making this whole thing possible. I want to give a quick shout out to our newest patrons. They are Richard Sunval. Dale Allen, Orther, Billy Dexheimer, Tim French, and Andy Hagen. If you'd like to join them and get some really cool perks, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Thanks a lot for watching. Please hit like and share your comments in the comments. That makes sense. Do you think Voyager will ever be found by another alien species? Share below. And if this is your first time here and you like the cut of my jib, uh, you might want to check out some of my other videos. I invite you to look at them. There's one right over here on the end screen that you might like. And if you do like them, I invite you to hit subscribe because I'm just going to keep making these things. All right. Thanks again for watching. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening week, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.